Alan, come up here. Alan has, uh, this is Alan Schliemann, he's with Stand to Reason. Uh, he's written a book on Islam, which I highly recommend to you, a little booklet on understanding Islam. And uh, uh, I would encourage you to go to str.org and get that and zillions of other great resources that are there. Uh, but Alan showed me last night during one of the breaks a little chart he has developed to help you very quickly categorize the type of pro-abortion argument you're hearing and quickly sort it. And once you do that, you intuitively know what your next step is because you don't have to sit there and go, now how does this fit to the bigger picture? And it limits the ability of your critic to send you down rabbit trails, a zillion of them. So I'm going to take a moment and just have Alan illustrate this chart for you because I think it's very helpful. Are you willing to email it out to anybody that wants it? Sure. Or can you place it on some kind of site or? Um, yeah, maybe I can give it to Scott Ray and when he sends out the other. Bingo. PowerPoint, I can send this one out. That would be great. So but It's in PowerPoint or a Word format. But I'm going to have Alan take just a moment and explain the chart that he showed to me so that you can see it. Yeah, so this came about as a result of preparing for a debate I was doing against the feminists earlier this year at Cal State San Marcos. And as I was trying to organize my own thoughts, it, it helped me to sort of categorize all the defenses for abortion that she might possibly bring up. And um, what I found was, and this is, um, I mean, I think it's something that you would you would recognize if you just look at, this, look at the information that we've gone over, that virtually all the arguments for abortion can be responded to by understanding just kind of the simple way of flow charting the argument. So first, you ask, is there defense for abortion? Uh, are they, um, if you ask the question, is the unborn human being in their defense for abortion? Now, in most instances, as Scott has pointed out, the answer is no. Uh, they're assuming that the unborn is not a human being. So if that's the case, then what you're going to do is try the toddler was one of the tactics that Scott was talking about. And so, of course, that narrows the whole discussion to the one question that matters, which is what is the unborn? And of course, you can make the case for the humanity of the unborn through science and, and well, basically the scientific argument. So if you ask the question, is the unborn a human being? And in their kind of defense for abortion, they're like, yeah, I, I think the unborn is a human being, which, by the way, was the position the feminist that was in the She says, yeah, I think they're a human being. But I still think that um, we still have an abortion because they're not a valuable human being or because they're not persons. And that's where this part of the uh, flowchart comes into play. Is asking the question, well, are, we all, are all human beings valuable? And she was saying, no, they're not. And so what in essence she was doing is saying there are certain qualities or characteristics, which I would argue are arbitrary, yeah. that she believes disqualify a certain class of human beings from being valuable or from being a person. And that's where, of course, the sled test comes in, because all the qualities or characteristics that she was going to offer and that she did offer fell under one of these four categories, size, level development, environment, and dependency. And so I was able to then respond with sort of a sled test type of response. And of course, if they say the unborn human being, and they think that all human beings are valuable, or they're all persons, just like Judas Jarvis Thompson, or uh, perhaps one and others, then basically the defense for abortion is based on a woman's bodily rights. Uh, trumping the child's rights, in which case uh, this this take the roof off as a tactic, stand to reason. It's just basically reductive at absurd, accepting the premises of their uh, or accepting the rationale for their argument, taking to its logical conclusion, show that it's absurd. Therefore, the rationale is absurd. So, and that's what Scott did in a lot of instances. He gave examples to show. Well, if you accept, you know, Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument, then this leads to this ridiculous. And then, of course, you just present the arguments responding to the violinist or bodily rights arguments. And so now, as I teach um, being abortion and thankful or all, all these kinds of arguments to students, I try to present them this chart because, as you can see, when you see it like this, it, it gives them a lot of confidence in recognizing, wait a minute, if I know how to do this, this, and this, yeah. then I, for the most part, can respond to virtually every defense for abortion that exists out there. And that's really the case. Uh, and then, in fact, when we take, uh, you know, I do a thing where we train students on the art of pro-life persuasion, and then we go out into, say, like a downtown area and have them engage passersby on uh, using a uh, abortion questionnaire, and of course that leads naturally to discussions about abortion. 
oftentimes these people bring up challenges in favor for abortion, and I'm telling you, 100% of the time, there are defenses for abortion following one of these street camps. And as a result, the students are prepared. And these are students that just after a day of training know how to deal with just about everybody in the street that they come across. So this just is a great way, to, I think, that helps to organize our thoughts and recognize that, look, every defense of abortion is going to fall into one of these three camps. And if you're prepared with these three categories of responses to their defenses, then you're very, very well prepared. Good. Excellent. Excellent. How many of you would like that mailed to you? Yeah, I think so. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Alan, for that. It's funny, when I looked at that chart, I immediately thought, I've been doing that in my own mind, but had never drawn it out. It's the way I automatically go that way, as you will, but it's nice to see it illustrated. Uh, and he's exactly right. 100% that I've ever encountered go into one of those three boxes. That's exactly right. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up with two things. First, we're going to very quickly look at five of the most common objections you'll get at the street level. So far in this seminar, we've been doing more advanced pro-life apologetics, which is appropriate. This is a graduate level seminar. And that's why your notes are written out extensively so you can follow the more sophisticated ideas that are out there and know how to deal with them. But the truth is, at the street level, you're not going to hear someone spouting Judith Jarvis Thompson. That person doesn't even know Judith Jarvis Thompson. So you'll want some ideas on how to just respond quickly to some of the most common street-level objections to the pro-life view. The first one being the infamous back alley abortion argument. Of those boxes that Alan just showed you, what, which one is that one going to fall into? Here's the argument. If abortion is outlawed, women are going to die in the back alleys of abor or, or at back alleys of America from dangerous illegal abortions. Okay, let's see if we, just thinking about that chart, what does that argument assume about the unborn? That they're not human. Because otherwise, isn't this argument saying that because some people will die attempting to kill others, the state ought to make it safe and legal for them to do it? I mean, why should the law be faulted for making it more risky for one human being to take the life of another completely innocent one? Are we going to legalize bank robbery to make it safer for felons? So this argument is clearly assuming something about the unborn. It's falling in that first one, that first box that Alan brought up. There's another assumption going on here, though, and that is that the law cannot stop all illegal activity. That's the typical argument. Well, you're never going to outlaw abortion and stop it. You can't stop all abortions. Question, is the issue whether we can stop all abortions or whether we can stop most? Do laws against rape stop all rape? No, but does that mean we don't pass any laws because we can't stop every last instance of it? Do we really think that the incidence of rape would go down if we made it legal? Clearly, the law communicates a permission slip to people if we remove the law and say, go ahead, there's nothing illegal about this. So the idea that we can't stop all abortions uh, is crazy. The issue is, can we stop most? Oh, incidentally, and this is in your notes, there, uh, prior to Roe v. Wade, studies indicate that at most there were 210,000 illegal abortions being performed a year, and that's an extremely liberal estimate. The more conservative estimates say between 30 and 50,000 a year. Let's go with the 210, though, just for the sake of argument. Within six years of Roe v. Wade, we had jumped to 1.5 million a year from 210,000. So I think the law did, in fact, do a fairly decent job discouraging the vast majority of abortions. But there's another issue here, and I think we need to deal with this very conclusively with people. This idea that women are forced into the back alleys of abortion because the law says you can't have one. I'm sorry, but women are not forced to have abortions. They choose to have them. Uh, I think it was Greg Kolkel who said, uh, you know, just because abortion is made illegal doesn't mean a woman is forced into the back alley 
Uh, I'm trying to think how Greg put this. Oh, that's right. It, it, or forced to rob a bank. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, this idea that you're, you're, you're somehow forced into doing something illegal just because we make it illegal, I mean, that, we need to challenge that. It doesn't there, take away their autonomy over their body, is really what you're saying. I mean, when they're saying that they should have complete autonomy, their autonomy right. isn't taken away by that law, by sure. the law being passed. They still have a choice. Yeah, that's right. They, they are not forced to do this any more than a man is forced to rob a bank because the state won't give him a social security payment. That's what I think the quote was, yeah. Uh, there's a factual response though as well. It is simply untrue that five to 10,000 women a year died from illegal abortion prior to Roe v. Wade. That is absolutely false. And we know that from a number of different sources. Let me give you a couple though that I think are most uh, convincing. Dr. Mary Calderon was the medical director for Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood being the nation's leading abortion provider and advocacy group. In 1960, when allegedly thousands of women were dying a year, if you listen to Barbara Boxer, from illegal abortion, the reality is, says Dr. Calderon in the 1960s uh, Journal of American Health, that the vast majority of abortions that are done illegally are done by physicians in good standing in their community, and as a result, the death rate is very, very low, said Dr. Calderon. And she made the point that there were a number of reasons for the death rate being low. One was the introduction of penicillin that made surgical procedures in general uh, much safer. But the biggest issue was women weren't going to some guy in a back alley with a rusty coat hanger. They were going to a physician who was willing to bend the law, a physician who was credible and trained, and therefore uh, the death rate wasn't an issue. And she flat out said that we need to face as a fact, she said, that illegal abortion is no longer dangerous. This from Planned Parenthood's own medical director in 1960. Dr. Christopher Teets, who was a statistician for Planned Parenthood, said it was completely nuts that five to 10,000 women a year were dying from illegal abortion. He pointed out that roughly 45,000 women of childbearing age die each year from all causes. And so it's crazy to say that so high a number would come from just one source, illegal abortion. Uh, the second argument you'll get at the street level is, is an ad hominem attack. That's where we attack the person rather than the argument. And the most popular one by far is you're a man and you can't get pregnant. What right do you have to speak on this issue when you're a man and you can't get pregnant? I've had this put to me. In fact, one time I remember a, a woman coming at me with eyes blazing, and her response to my pro-life case was to look at me, didn't refute my science, didn't refute my philosophy. She just looked at me and said, you're a man and you can't get pregnant. And I asked her, well, how does my gender have anything to do with the evidence I presented? She said, evidence isn't the issue here. You're a man. Men don't get pregnant. And borrowing from my friend Frank Beckwith, I looked right at her and said, well, how do you know that I'm a man? And she said, what? <laughs> and inside I'm thinking, oh, I've stepped in it now. Um, and she said something like, well, you got a deep voice. And I reminded her that Joan Rivers did too, so that wasn't going to get us anywhere. <laughs> but the point I was trying to make, it was Frank who gave me this idea of saying, how do you know I'm a man? I, and so he, he's nuttier than I am, believe me. Um, the point I was trying to drive home is that arguments don't have gender, people do. By the way, don't pro-life women use the same arguments that pro-life men do? Which means you have to refute our arguments. You can't just attack us fallaciously because you don't like our gender. Uh, incidentally, if no man can speak on abortion, we need to reverse Roe v. Wade because it was decided by who? Amen. Nine men. So this is a crazy idea, uh, but yet it's one we get. Another ad hominem we get is that you pro-lifers are, you're all against, ba you're all for babies before they're born, but you don't do anything for them after. <laughs> you're not willing to adopt all these children you don't want aborted. Here's the typical pro-life response. Oh yes we are, there's two million, of them will, two million of us willing to adopt. Wrong answer. It's true that there are probably two million, maybe more, of us willing to adopt. But that's not what the issue is here at all. Here's the question you need to ask. How does my alleged unwillingness to adopt a child justify an abortionist killing one? 
Suppose I said to you, unless you agree to adopt my three sons by noon tomorrow, I shall execute them. If you turn down my ultimatum, am I justified executing my sons? No. So my behavior does not justify killing an innocent human being. They're ignoring the central issue. Here's another one you'll get. Well, you pro-lifers are inconsistent. You support the death penalty, but you're against abortion. You're inconsistent, your whole case collapses. Well, usually my critic supports abortion, but is against the death penalty. Wouldn't that make him inconsistent? In other words, the sword cuts both ways. But here's the bigger question. Can the unborn still be human even if I'm inconsistent? How does my inconsistency throw out the scientific evidence that the unborn are distinct living and whole human beings and the philosophic evidence that there's no essential difference between that embryo I once was and the adult I am today that would justify killing me at that earlier stage? All they've done is attack me personally. They have not dealt with the evidence I've presented to make my case. It's just a personal attack and that's it. Oh, by the way, just so you know, the pro-life position is not that it's always wrong to take human life. That, that's not our view. Our position is it's always wrong to take human life without justification. And we believe that elective abortion unjustly takes the life of a human being, therefore we oppose it. That's very different than saying you can never kill. So they're attacking a straw man at that point, an argument that we're not making. And they're trying to make that uh, the issue. Um, now, sometimes the ad hominem is a little more subtle. Uh, Dennis Prager, for example, has on occasion, and by the way, I think Dennis Prager is one of the finest radio hosts around. If you don't listen to him, you should, because he's a very careful thinker. Uh, you will get smarter just listening to him. But on the abortion issue, I'm not quite with him. And one of the ways he has tried to justify early abortion is by saying, well, you know, if you pro-lifers really believe that the unborn are human, why haven't you picked up a gun to use force against abortionists the way you would use deadly force if someone were about to kill an innocent toddler? And because you're unwilling to use deadly force, uh, this really calls into question your belief about the unborn being human. That's the gist of his argument. I can see all kinds of problems here, and I haven't quite figured out how a guy of Dennis's caliber would fall for this one, but he has. Um, Dennis, I remember uh, a few years ago, talking on air about how terrible the Holocaust was that was going on at that time in Kosovo. And I wanted to call him up and say, Dennis, if you really believe that, why haven't you picked up a gun and gone over there to stop it? I mean, really, if my willingness to use deadly force is the only thing that uh, affirms my belief that it's wrong to take innocent human life in a particular context, then why haven't you picked up a gun to do that? But let's go to something more basic. Could the unborn still be human even if I'm inconsistent? Absolutely. The evidence is what we've got to look at, not whether my behavior matches my rhetoric. The truth is my behavior oftentimes doesn't match my rhetoric or stated beliefs like it does with all of us. We're flawed, sinful human beings. And sometimes we just don't make the connection. But it doesn't mean the argument we're making is not a right one. It means that maybe our behavior needs to change. Now, I don't think we are obligated to use deadly force. In fact, I would argue we shouldn't uh, for many reasons. Let me give an example that Greg Kokel has used that I think is very good. He says, in World War II, Allied soldiers were dropped incognito behind enemy lines in Europe prior to the D-Day invasion. And they were men who looked German, they wore German clothes, they smoked German cigarettes, they spoke German. These were guys that were spying out the land in anticipation of the upcoming D-Day invasion. Now, every one of these soldiers that were dropped behind enemy lines, we can rightly suppose, believed that Hitler was evil and believed the Nazis were evil. Can we agree on that? But they didn't immediately start killing every German soldier they happened to come across. Why? They were after bigger game, weren't they? They were 
there to lay the groundwork to take out the machinery of death. And if they had just started shooting individual Germans, they might have killed a few of them, but the larger operation would have been put in jeopardy. And therefore, it would have been morally wrong for them to do it because they would have put in jeopardy the operation that would have saved the most number of lives, right? So the fact that they didn't use deadly force at that point does not count against them doing what they did at that time. In the same way, pro-lifers are right to recognize that killing an individual abor abortionist is not going to save one child more than likely and is only going to result in stiffer restrictions on pro-lifers who work at clinics and pray outside them and result in more cultural obstacles to us achieving our goal. And therefore, the pro-lifer can make a prudential argument saying, hey, I'm not obligated to do that uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Another uh, argument we'll hear is that we are single issue. I hate to say this, but you hear this in evangelical circles a lot. Uh, just a little FYI, the next time an evangelical leader says to you, evangelicals are too involved in politics, I want you to look them in the eye and say, oh, how did you come to that conclusion? I have never once heard one of those guys back up their claim that we're too involved in politics. In fact, it's my view, we're not involved nearly enough. Not even close to being involved enough. You ask, well, I'll speak anecdotally. The evangelicals who have said this to me, one of my responses is to say, tell me, have you ever walked a precinct for a candidate? No. Can you tell me how a bill moves from committee to final passage in the House of Representatives? No. Have you ever donated money to a candidate for House, Senate? No. Here's one. Can you name your two U.S. Senators? Now, I'm sorry, but we are nowhere near being close enough to being involved in politics. And I don't speak here for Biola or Life Training Institute. I speak for myself when I say I don't believe for a moment we're too politically engaged, not even close. But let's take this single issue objection. Yeah, you're right. Abortion is not the only issue. Any more than slavery was the only issue in 1860, or defeating the Nazis in 1944. But it is the dominant issue. And careful thinking Christians know that you put greater weight on the dominant issues of the day than you do those that are not as dominant. Slavery was not the only issue in 1860. There was all kinds of territorial issues and disputes going on. But it was the major issue. It was the dominant one. And we give greater moral weight to the dominant moral issue. So of course we're going to put more emphasis on that. Uh, there is a left-wing evangelical and social um, uh, argument that you'll get sometimes where people will say, well, you, you pro-lifers put all your eggs in the abortion basket. What about war? War is killing. War is bad. I had this happen in Orlando, Florida, just prior to the 2008 election. I got done speaking at a Catholic high school with about 600 students, and this very kindly nun came up to me, and she said, you know, I really appreciate what you had to say. Uh, I just wish our students were completely pro-life. And I knew the buzzword. I've heard this before, so I knew what was coming. I said, oh, in what way? She said, well, I wish they were against war the way they're against abortion. And she said, that's why I'm going to be voting for Senator Obama, because he's against war. I said, sister? <laughs> uh, she said, yeah, the war in Iraq. I cannot vote for someone who supports a war like that. I cannot support someone who is in favor of an unjust war. Now, here's a little thing you need to know about Catholic moral theology, and it's very good on this point. She did not understand her own church's teaching, so I took opportunity, imagine this, a Presbyterian clarifying church teaching for the Catholic nun, but here it was. I said to her sister, is it not true that Catholic church teaching makes a distinction between absolute evils and contingent ones? By the way, that's an excellent distinction. War, in other words, is a contingent evil. It may be wrong if we engage in it without rational and moral support, but it's not wrong in principle. 
Abortion, however, elective abortion, the church teaches, is an absolute evil, and laws that permit it are scandalous. Everybody got that distinction in your mind? So here's the question I put to her. So help me out here, sister, if I understand you correctly, you're prepared to vote for a candidate who supports an absolute evil because you hope he might help us avoid a contingent one. You, you, you following where this went? In other words, she was assuming a moral equivalency here that isn't there even in her own church teaching. And yet, we see this happen a lot where Christians, evangelicals and Catholics, will equate all these issues together. Now, I watched something that made me just about come out of my seat uh, three months ago. ABC News had this panel of new evangelicals on there. They had these three people. And um, I wish I had brought the clip. I should have. They were asked by the moderator on national television, what are your top issues? First woman stood up and said, well, my top issue is educational inequity. The next guy said, fairness in the workplace. Another guy said, AIDS. And the moderator looked at them and said, I noticed you didn't once mention abortion. And they just continued throwing out other issues. Well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be stereotyped here. I'm sorry, but there's a world of difference between someone being deprived an education in the best school in America and a human being having, having his arms and legs ripped off. And even when pressed by the moderator, who was shocked at their avoidance of the issue, they didn't go there. There's something wrong with us when that's where we are. Something desperately wrong with us. We have a problem a whole lot worse than educational inequity. Yeah. I think what we got is educational ignorance. People don't understand basic moral reasoning, and that's why they're coming up with this kind of stuff. Uh, last two objections, then I want to talk about briefly what you can do in your churches to make a difference to help equip people uh, to engage. The tolerance objection. This is relativism. We've already talked about it. The basic argument is you shouldn't force your morality on me. But I get to force mine, but I get to force mine on you, precisely. Uh, relativism as a worldview fails for three reasons. The best book on this is Greg Kolkel and Frank Beckwith's book, Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair, uh, published by Baker in 1997. I suggest you get that book. Uh, but here are three things they highlight in that book, three problems with relativism. The first flaw with it is that it's self-defeating. When you say you shouldn't force your morals on me, you've just done what? Forced a moral view on uh, someone, right? Uh, the other problem with it is it can't say why anything is really wrong or evil, um, including intolerance. I mean, think about this for a moment. Hitler, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa liked to help people. Hitler, well, he liked to kill them. Who are we to judge? <laughs> if it's true that morality is up to us, then it's hard to say why one was better than the other. Again, I am not doing the topic of relativism justice because that wasn't the purpose of this seminar, but this is street level stuff when you're dealing with people at the street level, okay? The third problem with relativism is that it ends up being a, a philosophy no one can reasonably live with. No one can. C.S. Lewis was the one, I think, who said that a man who tells you there is no objective right and long, wrong is going to complain if you cut him off in line uh, or steal his orange. And that's exactly right. Uh, the, in the 1960s, we had people marching in the streets holding signs, one day saying, keep your morality off of me. The next day, they were marching in the streets saying Richard Nixon was evil for bombing Hanoi. So they don't live with this view in any way. And finally, let's talk about the hard cases, and then we'll transfer to our last thing that we're going to do. You will get those who will bring up cases of rape and life of the mother. And again, all these are in your notes, and they're dealt with in the book. The first thing people will say is, well, what about rape? And I want to give you a question that will help you frame this. Now, you need to be careful when this issue is brought up. Not because we don't have a good answer, but you don't want to appear insensitive. You want to show sympathy for that woman who's been assaulted. If you don't, you're going to lose on emotional grounds, even if you win on intellectual grounds, okay? 
So somebody comes up to you and brings up the rape issue. The person who brings it up will be one of two types of people. He will either be an inquirer or a crusader. The inquirer really wants an answer. The crusader just wants to make you look bad. And the way you deal with the rape issue depends on who you're talking to at that moment. Let's talk about the inquirer, the person who genuinely wants to know. I remember a high school in San Diego last year at an evangelical school. A girl brought this up, a Hispanic girl, very graciously brought it up, and she wanted an answer. She wasn't being smart, Alex. She really wanted to know, how do I, you know, what, what do you say to this? And so she said to me, in essence, I agree with your pro-life case, but I just, I can't see how it would work in the cases of rape. I, that's just one exception I can't uh, get around. So here's the question I asked her. I said, well, tell me why you think it's a powerful objection. Her answer was this. Well, because every time that woman looks at the child, she's going to remember what happened to her. And it doesn't seem fair to force her to bring this child to birth when it's going to serve as a reminder to her, okay? That was her reply. So, I didn't say, well, you can always adopt him. That, that wasn't going to get it done, all right? Very graciously, I asked a question that I once heard JP ask. I looked at her and very graciously said, tell me, how do you think a civil society should treat innocent human beings that remind us of a painful event? And I just let the question sink in for a moment. Then I followed up with, is it okay to kill them so we can feel better? What was her answer? No, no you can't do that. My reply? Why not? Well, because they're human beings. Now notice what that question got us back to. How should we treat innocent human beings that remind us of a painful event got us to the question, what is the unborn, right? Now we were on the right avenue. And I very graciously asked, I said, tell me, do you think hardship justifies homicide? If killing you makes me feel better, can I do it? And she said, well, no, you can't. And I then trotted out a toddler. I said, I have a two-year-old in front of me. Suppose his father was a rapist. Would it be okay to execute the toddler for the sin of his father? Well, no, you can't do that. And why is that? Well, because he's a human being. Ah, see, that's the question we need to answer. And then I gave an example to help her. I said, imagine that, well, first I laid out my principle. I said, sometimes it's better to suffer evil rather than inflict it. Imagine, for example, that I'm a soldier in Iraq and I'm leading a team of 10 men on a mission. And we get captured by terrorists. And the terrorists get me and say, you're the leader of these 10 men. In 10 minutes, we're going to start torturing you and your men to get intelligence out of you. But if you'll help us torture your own men, we won't torture you. Can I take that deal? No, I'm going to choose to suffer evil rather than inflict it. At that point, I looked at the girl, and I could tell she was still struggling a bit, but the lights were on. She was grasping the moral logic that was in place. The crusader will have none of it. The crusader is not listening to anything you say. The crusader simply wants to make you look bad, so your tactic is going to be a little different. What is the true position that the crusader wants, or, or the true, cru, true position that the crusader holds on abortion? Is it that it should only be legal in cases of rape, or is it that it's a fundamental right the woman can exercise for any reason? Which is it? Fundamental right. Fundamental right. But does he want to come right out and say that? In many cases, no. So he's going to hide behind the rape issue to take pot shots at you. You deal with that very differently. Here's how you deal with that. He brings up the issue of rape. What about this woman who's been raped? Yada, yada, yada. Go ahead and look at him and say, okay, for the sake of argument, I'm going to grant that we allow abortions in cases of rape. That's not my position, but I'll grant it in this case. Will you then join me in working to bring legal protection to all other unborn children that are not conceived through rape. What will his answer be? No, you, no, I won't. Well, then why did you bring rape up except to deceive us into thinking that you only oppose abortion in cases of rape when your real position is it's a fundamental right? Why don't you defend that position and not hide behind the case of rape? So it's a different approach in how you deal with this, okay? All right. Uh, the last objection we'll look at is the hard case objection of the mother's life. That usually comes down to 
ectopic pregnancy. That's what we're talking about, where the embryo implants on the inner wall of the fallopian tube instead of the uterine wall, where it should implant. In that case, what's going to happen as that embryo grows in that narrow tube? That tube's going to rupture. The mother is going to hemorrhage to death. If you think I'm kidding, go to the Centers for Disease Control website, look up ectopic pregnancy. The medical protocols are unmistakably clear. Dramatic, immediate medical intervention is required. That means ending the pregnancy because we do not have a way to transfer that embryo, that human being, to another location where it can live. So what's the right thing to do in this case? Is the right thing to do to simply walk away from the situation and do nothing and let two people die? Or is the right thing to do to act in such a way that you save one life even though the unintended and unavoidable result is the death of a human being? Which is it? The second. It's better to save one life rather than lose two. There are two pro-life objections to this. The first says, well, you're not having faith in God. You're not trusting Him. He could work a miracle. Dr. Ray talked about this a little bit today. That is presumption, if I may just cut right to the chase. If there is a morally acceptable way in front of you, and you do not take it and demand that God do something else instead, that's not faith, that's presumption. One other warning. I will hear pro-lifers say, well, I know people who survived ectopic pregnancies. Uh, I simply don't believe the stories because the medical evidence is overwhelming in this case. So the question before us is, are we going to do nothing or are we going to act in such a way that we save one life rather than lose two, even though the unavoidable and unintended consequence is the death of the embryo? The answer is we save one life rather than let two lives live. That's called the law of double effect if you're wondering, or the principle of double effect if you're wondering what that's called. It simply means that if action A is morally correct, but there's an unintended consequence, we'll call B over here, I can still do A if my motive and intent are right. Is the physician killing an embryo to get it out of the woman's life so she can go to college and have a great career? No, he's trying to save her life, and in the process of saving her life, there's this unavoidable consequence. So he acts to do the greatest moral good he can in that case, which is to save one life, rather than lose two. Uh, and that is, I think, good moral thinking. That's how you make the best you can out of that situation. How do you pastor a pregnant woman who is being encouraged by physicians to terminate her pregnancy because of um, test results on the fetus that have come out that the baby is sick with something that the baby cannot live outside the womb with? How do you deal with uh, in a pastoral level with people who, or a woman who might be carrying a child who she's been told has some illness that the child cannot survive outside the womb or will not survive for long, maybe? Yes. Okay. Or make it through childbirth or live. If it lives, it probably will not live. Will not live that long. Yeah. Uh, first thing you do is the people who are advocating abortion at that case, in that case are assuming what about the unborn in this position? that they're not human. Suppose I had a two-year-old in front of me who's not going to live more than another month. Would it be okay to kill him because he will die sooner rather than later? All of us are going to die at some point, right? Do those who are going to live longer have a right to kill those who will live shorter? That's the moral question that needs to be raised. So there, there, you asked, though, a pastoral question, so I, I want to go to that. That's the moral thing you need to do. The pastoral condition here needs to be this. Number one, of course, you're going to come alongside that person and show them tremendous empathy and, and compassion. And you're, as a body of Christ, you're going to rally around that person and help with the practical needs they have and walk them through that. That, that goes without saying. But there's a theological point that needs to be driven home here, gently, but driven home here. And that comes down to this. Do we or do we not believe in the sovereignty of God when it comes to particular children. The Bible clearly tells us who made the mouth of the person who can't speak. God did. He sovereignly did that. And could God have purposes 
or I should say, could he have morally sufficient reasons for creating people who aren't going to live long and who will die soon and therefore uh, should not be killed uh, because they still are people who bear his image. And I think always, when in doubt, go to the sovereignty of God. And this is a case in point because the Bible does clearly teach that God has made those people that way. Uh, we don't like to think of it that way. Uh, the sovereignty of God is something a lot of us are, are struggle with. It's normal to struggle with it to some degree. But these are not accidents if we take Scripture seriously. And that means that child has a purpose. It may not be a purpose that goes more than a day or two or a week or, a, or two, but that does not become a justification for killing him. And at the same time, just because nature is going to take its course with that child doesn't give me a right to deliberately interfere and cause it to happen. So um, you're going to show the compassion, but you're going to bring home that theological truth. Uh, Clay Jones, who is a professor here at Biola, has a CD set you need to just get, okay? Just mark it down. You need to get this. It's on the problem of evil. And one of the things Dr. Jones brings out in his CD, his lecture, is that when we truly, truly contemplate the condition we are in outside of, Cro of Christ, lost, dead in sin, without hope, and then after we contemplate that for a great deal of time, then contemplate the unbelievable glory that awaits us in heaven. It helps us make sense of suffering here and now. So for a Christian, you have that open to them. You can pastor them on that level as well. Um, obviously, there's more that could be done, and given I'm not a, a crisis counselor, uh, my answer won't be complete, but that's gently the way I would go with the person. Well, uh, you know, on a personal level, and I, there's a few different situations that I've been personally involved in this. And um, I'll try not to cry. That's okay. Cool. But one of the things that, um, when it comes to that point of making that decision, it's almost like God came into their life, you know, and made something happen that allowed them to make that decision. For instance, at that 24-week mark where it, it wouldn't be able to make that decision anymore. You know, something happened with the baby where it was an indefinite, this is what's happening with the baby. Or there was a definite diagnosis where, you know, you kind of just felt that God was there and he allowed you to make that decision. I, I wouldn't for a moment minimize the emotion of this situation. But I think we do need to be careful while we come alongside people that we think that a feeling of permission would trump a moral principle that's objective. And the objective moral principle here is that if human life is intrinsically valuable and humans have value because of whose image we bear, we cannot take their lives uh, without having justification. And if, for example, if we had a toddler up here who was going to die soon and die within hours or days, we would not directly kill him because his chances of survival would not be good. Or, or even if we knew for sure he was dying. Now, there is one way here that is different than what you just described. There are cases where the fetus dies in the womb. Well, then there's no issue. You, end, you can definitely end the pregnancy at that point. Pregnancies at that point is just inducing birth. Yeah. Right? So the baby does die in the womb or afterwards. No, no, I'm talking about where the child is already dead. The child dies in the womb. The woman is not required to carry a dead fetus. Um, you know, this got brought home to us real close because just down the street from us, there's a family that has five boys, and they've played in the neighborhood with our kids. And uh, he's a Delta Airline captain, and we're praying for these people to come to know Christ, but four years ago, she was pregnant with a child. The doctor said, there's a hole in the baby's heart. It's not going to live. And that diagnosis devastated that family. Uh, I mean, just was devastating to them. And to her credit, Katie said, my baby's going to die, 
within hours of being born, but by golly, he's going to be born. And uh, she carried that child to term, and sure enough, it died within an hour or two of birth. And uh, she said, it's going to be born. Now, I don't, she, not a Christian, but she understood the moral implications, and uh, I, I believe she did the right thing. But you're right, it's difficult, absolutely difficult. I don't think there is moral permission that's granted at an emotional level that would trump an objective moral principle. Uh, but I think we definitely have to pastor people through this and help them through it. I liked what Scott Ray said today. It, it really hit home. We all need to learn how to die well. We all need to learn how to die well. Uh, we're all in that same thing. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.